there's something else about me. I love to tell the story of work. You know, Russians have a, a statement for that. They say, Krisha payakala, which means the roof came off. It's a way of saying you're crazy. You love to talk about work. For most folks, work is a dirty word. Work is something that is a word that is associated with toil, difficulty, unpleasant, drudgery, even dehumanization. But like Rob prayed, boy, you got a lot of theology in that prayer. Those are the best prayers. They follow the story that God's talking about. I do love to tell the story of just about everything because God's revelation comes to us as a story. Scripture does not come to us as a theology textbook, topically organized, uh, systematically arranged, taking all of the, the propositions from all over the text, the proof text perhaps, and compiling them into coherent and consistent uh, theologumena, which the Eastern Church calls theological opinions. For God told us a story, and it's by this story that uh, I, I get uh, charged up about. And so we're going to attempt to talk about this topic that is fraught with uh, maybe a lot of negative in light of the story. And it's important that we do this because I said we're going to have distorted theological conclusions if we do not attend to the narrative, to the story that God has given to us. And unfortunately, I think uh, pretty much uh, any system of theology that doesn't attend to the story and the narrative is going to be distorted. So we've got two topics here. We need to talk about, uh, you know, what's the big story that God is telling and how does work fit into that? Okay? A couple of uh, dangers. We need to not only attend to the narrative, but what version of the narrative are we talking about? Interesting book I came across a couple of years ago. It's called The God of Israel and Christian Theology by R. Kendall Solon. And uh, he's a fascinating writer, but he is probing the story. And he calls it the classic church or traditional Christian narrative. And he says it consists of four parts. He says, and you'll recognize them, I did, okay? Uh, I organize uh, a lot of my theological thinking that way. First one is creation. Yes, we get that. That's Genesis 1 and 2. Second one is fall. We get that. We're living in that. Third one is uh, we're also enjoying this too in some measure, redemption in Christ. And the final one is consummation, heaven. Four episodes. Yes, like I said, I, I, I organize all my theological thinking. You can do Christology that way, salvation that way, uh, doctrine of human beings that way, anthropology that way. But someone asks the question, is something missing from this four-episode version of the story? And you know, it's often in the, the details of what's missing by where you tell the integrity of a system. What's absent? Is there anything missing, he asks. Well, he goes on and talks about, uh, yeah, you don't need two-thirds of the Bible to tell that four-version story, four-episode story. You got... Episode 1, Genesis 1 and 2, you got episode 2, fall is in Genesis 3, and then you can jump all the way to Matthew, New Testament, and off you go with redemption and tie it all off in Revelation. And you end up with that, you know, you're just on its face. You don't need two-thirds. Houston, we have a problem. It doesn't sound right. So that's going to be one of my burdens uh, before, for today and for next week is to talk about work maybe with a different version of the story that includes Israel, Israel's story, two-thirds of the Bible, two-thirds of God's revelation to us. Do we learn things about what our work was intended to achieve? Do we learn things about how that interfaces with salvation, what human beings were intended to, to do and called and commissioned to do? He makes a statement here, still construed in Christianity's traditional narrative, Israel's story contributes little or nothing to understanding how God's consummation and redemptive purposes engage human creation in universal and enduring ways. You know, Jesus said salvation is from the Jews. And for the traditional version of the story, that pretty much comes down to Jesus was Jewish. He was human, so he had to have some ethnicity. All right, we'll make him Jewish. But it was really kind of 
you know, after the fact. He's the abstract, he's the incarnation of the Logos, not the incarnation of the God of Israel. And that's what the New Testament writers want us to hear. What does that part of the story tell us not only about Jesus, but ourselves and our work? And so that's kind of where we're going. We've got a two parts. We've got a, a huge task, okay? And uh, we will get out on time today. I have things to do, and so do you. But today we're going to talk about the uh, first part of the story. We'll take it up to Genesis 9. I've broken it up weird, all right, because I'm not playing by the usual playbook. And then next week we get the whole rest of the deal, Genesis 10 through Revelation, all right? So, so be sure and come for next week, yeah. But uh, the story, we're going to start here in the beginning. In the beginning was work. I don't think that's how it reads, is it? Well, actually, we're talking about the story in the beginning was a king who works. You see, when it says, in the beginning, God, we're talking about a sovereign act, creative fiat, where he brings out by speech all that is, just by raw power, and he's a king. Other parts of scripture confirm there's a king working here in Genesis 1. It's a kingdom story. It's, by the way, not a redemption story. Yes, redemption is an important aspect, but I think it is still going to be reserved and we need to see it as nothing more than a sub-theme to a bigger topic. How do I know that? Well, just take uh, the raw data of Scripture. Where does redemption story start? Well, unless you're Karl Barth, who said that when God said it is very good in the end of the first narrative, he, Karl Barth says, he meant, this, the writer means, it was good for redemption. It doesn't say that, friends. Redemption starts when something's broken and lost. That story starts in Genesis 3, and you have the, what they call the first telling of the gospel since the early fathers have seen this as the Proto-Evangelium, Genesis 3.15, where God intends to restore but he doesn't restore it just for its own sake. He restores it to return it to what was in Genesis 1 and 2 before what got broken happened. To go on the other end, I'm going to need a theme that's going to be able to cover uh, Genesis 1 and 2. When does redemption stop? When's it over? When's that story that, it's a powerful sub-theme, sub when does that story end in Revelation? What chapter? Well, at the end of chapter 20 is when you have great white throne, judgment, uh, and death and Hades are emptied, and everything's settled. But you still have two more chapters, 21 and 22. So redemption is still can't handle both ends. So I need something that can give me all if I'm going to talk about Bible story. I think kingdom is it. And I can, I can find kingly royal resonance in the first part. Okay, Psalms tells me, 95 tells me that it was a king who created. I also see this king make an image that has royal and is supposed to rule and subdue things. So I got some inklings already of reigning and royalty. On the other end, Revelation 22.5 says, Our occupation in heaven will not just be to serve the Lord, it will be to reign forever and ever. So I have royal... I have bookends. I can do it that way. I can't do it with redemption. So I see redemption is intended to fulfill the story of kingdom and reign. And we're supposed to participate in that story. So it is a king, but it's a king who works. You know, putting those two, those two ideas together was a little bit awkward in the ancient world. The creator God, no, he created humans. If you listen to other ancient uh, tellings of the creation story, he creates humans to do work. That's not what the, what the creator God does. That's beneath him. Work is, see, they're still working with negative. Work is something for drones. Work is something hard. That's not worthy. It's for the invisible of society. It's not for the, for the deity. But the deity of scripture. Israel's God works. He plants a garden. He plants a garden. 
And he introduces uh, six days you shall work and one day you need to rest. Not because he's tired, but this kind of closeness to our rhythm of life that he established for us, this, it makes him a little bit too earthy and a too gritty for the ancient world. Israel's God works, and he's not ashamed to ply his hands. When we come to the New Testament, it's not by accident that Jesus comes as a builder. Like, and let's uh, dispel right now the carpenter idea. The, word, the, he, the Greek word etekton means a builder. Don't get the idea of Jesus in his little, little uh, studio con, you know, making up articles of wood. He works with stone. They didn't have a lot of wood in Judea of the first century. And a lot of the things that Jesus talks about in his parables, making cisterns, millstones, those kinds of things, he likely did that stuff. So he's the guy with the utility belt on, the builder. He, needs, he does that for 20 years. That's not something you just skip over. It's something human. We need to see humanity and the blessing of work and work sanctioned by God himself when he comes in human flesh. So God works. The king works. And he makes an image. I've already already uh, intimated that. And here we get into something that theologians, we like to use fancy Latin words. We say imago. Okay? The imago dei, the image of God. Well, this is one of the unique things about human life, separates us from all animal life. No other creature is made in the image of God. So we're unique that way. And so this, this rhetoric starts in Genesis chapter 1, 26, and moves on. And the principal task for work, is we're going to see it, it shows up very soon in verse 28 of that chapter. And you see five callings in the commission. Be fruitful, multiply, fill, rule and subdue. Okay? It's in the ruling and the subduing where you're going to see the definition of work I'm going to give you in a second start to start to realize. The ruling and the subduing. And so we need to explore this a little bit, and that's going to be the burden of what we're talking about mostly today. All right? Is, uh, you know, what's the image of God? What does it mean to be human? What is Adam type of work is one place we're going to, to take this. So you see a little bit, uh, here's the globe. I don't know if this was the shape of the continents back in Eden Day or if there's any significant drift since then. But uh, think about it. They are, God plants a garden and he puts Adam in it, it says. Adam's not native. He's the first immigrant, all right? He is not native to Eden soil. In fact, his, the dirt of his body comes from other parts of the earth. Now, can you be outside of Eden? Was Eden covering the whole globe at the time? Maybe you haven't thought about that, but you don't have to think very far to get the idea that, no, it wasn't. You could go east of Eden. That's what Cain did when he got kicked out of it. The cherubim with the fiery sword guarded the way to Eden. So there was a sacred space, a sanctuary, a temple in some part of, and if you want to put it in the cradle of civilization, we tried to put it there. I don't know if that's in the cradle of civilization there, okay? But God plants a garden. He puts humans in it, and it's very interesting here at this point. Genesis 2.5 speaks about God kind of waiting for humans to show up before he's going to set things off, even in the creative process. It says in Genesis 2-5, rain had not fallen on the earth and no plant had sprouted for there was no man to work the ground, to serve the ground. So God's got an oasis garden, but what's outside of it? Okay? That tells us, and uh, many theologians, biblical theologians are seeing this, that the end in Revelation is already informing how we are need to see the, the commission going on right here. That they, Adam and Eve, were together charged with expanding the boundaries and the order of Eden to cover the world. Outside is not evil. It is still good, but it is undeveloped. All right? It is untouched. It is un- hasn't been served by human work. So here's the commission is to expand the sacred temple space, the order, the culture, if you will, of Eden to the whole globe. Now we can go further. 
talking about image, Imago work, uh, unpack it in a few dimensions. And I call them means here, but there's just more, uh, you know, kind of uh, exploring around in the image idea of Genesis chapter 1. It's empowered by God. Have you ever wondered, you know, you know where's the Trinity in uh, Genesis chapter 1? Well, you got God uh, speaking. I got two of them right there. I got a, a, an author, a source, and his word. Jesus is the word. So I can see two of them there. Where's the spirit? Well, the spirit shows up in verse 2, obviously. He's hovering over the surface of the deep. And, and don't take this as something, oh, he's just kind of floating around, having a good time. Hey, guys, let's everybody just watch what God doing. No, the, the word is full of restraining. It's even a conflicted type of notion. So the spirit's doing something already. But you think a little bit further into the story. Where's the spirit with Adam and Eve? Well, David Kleins wrote a seminal article back in the 60s about images in the ancient Near East, and he helps us to understand what's going on. See, we see other images in the Bible. Nebuchadnezzar makes images in Daniel, and the people are supposed to worship the image while the real guy's standing right there. Well, they could do that because their worldview says that an image contained the spirit, was indwelled by the spirit of the one it images. That's why they needed to treat that statue as not just uh, something uh, made by human hands, but as something that had a metaphysic to it, that had the spirit of Nebuchadnezzar was there, and that's what they would do. And when they would you know, come raging through and conquering empires, they would leave these statues in the places as they moved on conquering. That's to let the people know whose they were. You serve this statue. It's like me being here is what the emperor is telling the conquered people. And so they leave images in their way. Well, that informs a whole bunch of what's going on here in Genesis 1. God makes an image. Where's the spirit? You know, a couple years ago, I was in a conversation that uh, happened here on campus. Uh, the dean at the time, Dennis Dirks, invited a personal friend who was a rabbi from Simon Wiesenthal Center in L.A., and he had come to see if there could be some sort of collaboration in co-belligerence in the culture war. And so we're sitting around, and, and he's making the case, and he says, you know, you know we, we, we Jewish are never going to get that Jesus thing. We're never going to get there. But we started to spend a long time studying, you know, what you called the Old Testament, and so maybe, you know, there can be some collaboration on that. And he used it, he gave some example. And he gave the example, and I remember hearing this, and I almost fell off my chair. He said, you know, we have a tradition that when Adam and Eve were in the garden, they're fellowshipping with God in the cool of the day. And the language there says they walked with God. Our image, our thinking immediately goes to, well, they're side by side. You know, they're walking around in the cool of the, of the garden like we would do. He says, our tradition... We have a line of tradition that says that the voice of God before sin was in such harmony with Adam and Eve that it was internal to them. And I'm linking voice and spirit and images and things I know. And I'm also thinking, Ooh, the new covenant is about, I will write, put a new spirit in you. I will write my law in your heart and cause you to walk in my way. Christ in you, all of this language is floating. And I see the circle coming. What sin did to the spirit pushed him out. Fellowship with God is broken, and we'll get there a little bit in a few minutes already. Separation, alienation starts. The new covenant is bringing this back and healing it. And we're already the first fruits of this. We're enjoying this spirit, the depth of the spirit penetration of our life knowing this. So I see empowerment going here, and there's, there's huge stuff behind image. What else do we see? Guided by God, God's, remember God is, uh, he's planted the garden, he set the template. Make everything like this is what he, he gives the blueprint to Adam and Eve. Make the whole world like this including the relational components that we have with one another. You know, the harmony that God has with his creature. 
And so it's, it's a vice regency that the image is talking about. And it is intended to expand and to go somewhere, but you can see a little bit further by the, how the first narrative ends. It ends not in the creation of human beings, it ends in Sabbath. And there's only three things God blesses in the first narrative. And that's huge when God blesses something. He blessed the animals, he blessed humans in the commission, Genesis 128, and he blessed the Sabbath. You know, what's the difference between those two things? There's objects, animals and humans, and then there's a time period. The significance and the exegetes tell us the significance here is that we are dealing with something that's all-encompassing. Sabbath was, the reality of Sabbath, Sabbath peace, Sabbath rest, was supposed to color the whole picture. That's what it's all going to. Sabbath rest, Sabbath glory, Sabbath peace. And so there you also have the template of where it's going. Adam and Eve were to expand Sabbath in their sacred space commission to the whole world by their work. There's a third one. This is one not uh, often thought about because we don't have the robust, or we, we have in our, in our Western world that pushes out the supernatural, we don't have a robust theological worldview like they did in Scripture. Meaning, there is God, yes, we have that, but there's angelic beings and they are part of this picture too. They're in the story as well, but something significant here in the language, rule and subdue language, is not just, is not something about, uh, you know, extend the food supply, make sacred space, make it a garden, all of, no, these are conflicted, these are militaristic terms. They are words that connote there's something hostile there and you're supposed to take it out. You follow the word kabosh and shamar that are used for what humans are called to do. It implies their expansion goal would be kind of resisted and they would overcome it. They were empowered to overcome it and bring order. At this point of the story though, the only thing negative is an angel or a demon or a demonic force, Satan. Is it too far out of your thinking to say that it's human to dominate the angelic world? What do we do with Paul's statement in 1 Corinthians chapter 6? We will judge angels one day. That's human. The Bible knows this tradition that human commission includes dominating hostile forces, even angelic ones. And so when Jesus comes on the scene, he is anointed by the Spirit after his baptism. He goes right away to the wilderness. Or rather, he is driven by the Spirit to the wilderness to do what? To do a human thing. He's not pulling out a God card here. He's confronting Satan as a man was supposed to do. It is human. And it's part of Adam and Eve's call. They didn't do so well, though. We go to the third part of the story, or the, or the next part of the story, we need to come for a definition of work here. Notice there's nothing in here about getting paid. Work is not defined by what you're paid for. It can be, but it is not limited to that. It's productive, look at for these ends. This is a very concise definition and we could spend a long time on it. It is in the, in the, in the sight of God. It is for the good of others. And guess what, you get benefit out of it too. There's, I put it here as instrumental. It's something you do, you're active about, okay? And you can do this in a lot of ways that aren't compensated for. So let's enlarge our thinking. It is human to do this. We are blessed to do this. Instead of uh, how most Americans, if you look statistically, most Americans uh, work to live, the Bible has it the other way. You live to work. We were made to work. And unsavory as that sounds, that's, our, that's, our, that's the trajectory and the vector of our story. But we need to uh, move a little bit further when we see ruin and curse. Rob mentioned that. Comes into the story. 
and we see now work take a different turn. You know, Adam and Eve, you know, Eve gets pinned with this, but they were both plenty guilty. They were supposed to rule and subdue together, and that's what the enemy does the first thing. He separates them. And here you get some insight, I think, into, you know, human nature and uh, genders, how we function. It's fascinating. You know, he talks to Eve, you know, but, uh, you know, what's Adam doing? The text kind of gives the idea he's close at hand, but, uh, you know, together, he should have uh, come up here. His fault, right, at this point was saying, hey, there's some serpent stuff going on here. Wait, wait, what's, let me in here. He should have wedged his way in there. She should have invited him in so that they're both. But instead, she took the reins, and he stayed by playing his video games. Okay? And the result is alienation from God, and work now becomes, we start to see these things enter the story. Work becomes an instrument of autonomy from God. You take the Babel story in Genesis chapter 11. No mention of God of what they're going to do when they're, their technology of building this ziggurat. No mention of God. They're going to solve their problems without him. We're going to make a name for ourselves, and we're going to be secure. And you can tell the, the spirit of this thing by who's building it in chapter 10. It's Nimrod. Never name your kid Nimrod, okay? <laughs> Never name your kid Nimrod. Nimrod, and you see how he's described in Genesis chapter 10. He's the guy doing this in chapter 11. And it is an anti-God. It is not just autonomous. It is anti-God. So technology is now, we're solving our problems without God, or we think we are. But it's also now work comes in the story as a means of exploiting others. Slavery is part of the story. Think about the work involved in Cain and Abel way back in chapter 3 and chapter 4. It's by their work that the contention rises, that their spirit shows itself in their submission to God. And uh, in chapter 4, Cain's line, you know, his, his descendants, Jubal, Jabal, Tubal, Cain, there's some good names for your kids too, okay? Now though, they are, this is where the beginning of all the sciences, now science can be put, and metallurgy is made for making weapons of war, for killing, for exploiting, for dominating, for hate. Work is now serving this. And finally, the other dimension of the image, work is now, not just suffers, the ground is cursed and it's hard to work it, but now humans are, are empowered out of selfishness to exploit creation. And we, and we dominate it. Uh, a couple of years ago, I looked at uh, people, PETA's website, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. Number three down here, is uh, exactly what they pin on what they think Christians are all about and why Christians are the number one enemy to them. Because they think we have a dominion theology and that gives us permission to exploit and dominate the creation. No, that's a false, cursed picture. That's not the beginning picture. Genesis 1 is a different picture. So work is now suffering curse. What's happening with uh, kingdom, though? Remember, we're going to tie these two things together. And here's, I'm going to introduce a couple of terms here, and they're going to be more useful next week. Adam work and Noah work. Because these are two, what should I say, principal figures that start uh, a new lineage. Adam, or Noah, is an Adam figure. God's uh, moved on, but there's kind of a new Adam kind, and it's in Noah. And you can tell there's telling things about how God addresses and work happens to each of them. Follow the little table here, Adam and Eve in Genesis 1, 28, five commands. And we see the work primarily in the ruling and the subduing. Be fruitful, multiply, fill is the means by which humans would do this. It would be a bigger job than two could handle, so they need to multiply the image needs to conquer the world, all right? Make order, make Eden's culture in the world. If you look in Genesis 9, God says the same things, almost, to Noah. Be, these are the same Hebrew words. Be fruitful, multiply, and fill. But there is this left off. Something's happened now to rule and subdue. 
I wouldn't say they're absent, I would say they're now perverted. If you continue reading in Genesis 9, you see fear and violence now enters into the picture, whereas before it wasn't there. And you see the whole thing summarized, here's now where we are and where Adam was not. And so our work is going to be conflicted and our ruling and subduing is going to be compromised by this. Plus, there's an adversary still running around. And so work is going to follow this kind of, of a table. But we see something for kingdom, too. That this part of kingdom, ruling and subduing, is not something happening now because this is where we are. We're still here. We're still battling with this. So let me summarize this, and this will tell you a little bit about where we're going next week. We've introduced two kinds of work. There's Adam work, there's Imago work, not tainted by sin. We're going to see that this work is making a return. And we see the, uh, the new work of the powerful spirit that has been poured out now because of Pentecost and the exaltation of the risen Christ. You know, Jesus didn't rise just to conquer death. He rose to go somewhere and to do something. And that was to pour out the Spirit. And so the Spirit comes, and we see these things, and we're familiar with these things of what's going on now. That's kingdom. It's kingdom stuff. And it also means in something that colors the work we do. So Adam work is coming back, but there's still Noah work. We still labor under Noah work. We still have compromised ruling and subduing. You know, William Wilberforce, uh, Christian man, you know, eliminated slavery from the, from the British Empire, the superpower of the 18th century, 19th century, early 19th century. Did he end slavery? Today we call it human trafficking. And it's worse than it was then. We work for these things, but we still labor, that there's still corruption, there's still a world system, and therefore, I'd say things like this, and we're going to get here. Even we, in our work, we will never bring, the artifacts of our work will never dominate culture. And that's one of the differences of the two stories for Jesus. Remember, the traditional story has four episodes. It reduces Jesus to the king of hearts. Israel's version of the story is going to make Jesus the king of nations, and work will serve that. And we'll see that much more next week. We'll talk also about the tolerated adversary. It is human, it is imago stuff, imago work to move against, to overcome hostile forces, to put down Satan. Something happened truly to Satan at the cross, but he has still got things he's doing. He is working in the sons of disobedience. He is still a force that we need to be warned against in the New Testament. He's still doing things. He's not doing them under his own will. He is tolerated. And that's why our work is still going to suffer. That's why the MO of the day is power through weakness. But, and a lot of folks tell the story this way. This is a good book, by the way. I don't particularly care for the way the story is told, but there are good insights here about culture making. It taps into something that we, we were made to do. We were made to solve problems. We were made to make things better. And so we, we, we revel under stories of William Wilberforce. We love stories where justice triumphs, but we don't see it as lasting in this day. The work and the achievements that we have in beauty and harmony and uh, technology and discovery and knowledge, they still suffer because there's an, another system still around. And we labor, we have hope, but uh, he's right here. We can't change the world. But that's, un that's not the end of the story. That's not where we're going. And in the version that he tells it is, our time here is just kind of hang on for heaven. 
Next week, we're going to see that Israel's version of the story tells us, no, you, you have power and weakness now, but there's coming a time when there's going to be power through power, and you will dominate, and you will bring resolution to scarcity. You will bring resolution to ju- injustice. You will bring resolution to prosperity or poverty instead of just toil and labor under it. Image work will return. And I started off saying that uh, work is a pretty negative thing. A uh, recent uh, addition to the growing volume of work literature is uh, by the marketing director of Chick-fil-A, and he's written a book, and he just talks about, you know, why, he just says, when was the last time you looked forward to going to work? You know, Sunday night, and you're looking forward to Monday morning, I can't wait. He says, it's usually probably one of the first years you were working. Since then, it's become something that you want to retire from, something that you want to get away from, and uh, it's not. And it is that for most Americans. He says that's because we are working under a fallen, fallen, fallen value, that it, value that is value extracting, meaning it's laborious and it's hard because I don't see what it does for me anymore. Adam work that we has already started, that the spirit is already pushing, is already at work and it is saying you can produce things that serve. You can work value addition in your work and that's human and you were made for that. And that's the story that we will follow next week as we uh, tie this one off. So let me pray and we'll be dismissed. Biola University prepares Christians to think biblically about everything from science to business to education and the arts. Learn more at biola.edu.